Hello friends and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are on lesson number 10 of our study together, Making Friends for God. This particular lesson is entitled, An Exciting Way to Get Involved. I want to encourage you to get involved by grabbing your Bible and a pen and a paper to take notes and your Sabbath School quarterly. If you don't have a quarterly, you can always go to your local Seventh-day Adventist church. They would be delighted to give you a quarterly or you can go to the following website absg.adventist.org. That stands for Adult Bible Study Guide. .adventist.org. You can download the lesson and study along with us today. So glad that you have tuned in for this study. Lesson number 10. It's hard to believe we're getting on the, the other side here of our quarterly. What an incredible study it has been. This one is an exciting way to get involved, talking specifically about small groups and how we see small groups in the Word of God. I want to introduce our panel at this time to my left, Brother Pastor Kenny Shelton, so glad to have you here. Yeah, always good, always a pleasure to study the Word of God. Amen. To your left, Pastor Ryan Day, so glad to have mm -hmm. you here as well. It's always well. a blessing to be here. Amen. I always love studying with each one of these men of God and students of the Word. Pastor John Denzi, so grateful that you joined us this week as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to talk about New Testament small groups. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Yeah. And last but not least, mm -hmm. Pastor John Lomacain will absorb everything as it goes down the line. And right. grateful that you're here. I'll take what's left. All right. <laughs> <laughs> small group dynamics. Good to be yeah. here. Amen. Thank you. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, Pastor Kenny, would you pray for us? Oh, absolutely. Most gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to come before Thee and call Thee our Father. Mm. We come before Thee because we sense our need of a Savior. We sense our need of the power of the Holy Spirit. We invite Your precious presence to be with us. Illuminate our hearts and our minds that we may be focused upon heaven. We may be focused upon Your Word. And Lord, we pray it will be to Your honor and mm. to Your glory. Bless everything that's said, everything that's mm. done. Bless every aspect of taping this program so it will be for your honor and for your glory. Lord, you are in charge. We turn it all over to you. We thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 An exciting way to get involved. God placed us in community. Did he not? Mm -hmm. We need each other yeah. for encouragement and support, for Bible study and prayer, for evangelism and outreach. Always two are better than one. As we look at small group evangelism, and speaking of two are better than one, I want to start with Ecclesiastes, if you want to turn there. And then we'll jump into our memory text and Sunday's lesson. Ecclesiastes 4, we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4. Um, the, I want to ask the question, how do Others help us. Mm. How are we helped? By being in community with other people. So let's look at that. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their mm. labor. Mm. Two reap, you could say, a greater profit. Two involved in evangelism is better than one because we have different gifts, mm -hmm. because we can offer encouragement to each other, mm -hmm. because two can spur each other to a greater zeal for Bible study and prayer and evangelism. Let's read the next verse, verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up, to offer encouragement mm -hmm. and help. Have you ever been maybe a bit discouraged in doing outreach or Bible studies or, yeah. or reaching out to someone in your community or in your neighborhood? It's always good to have someone else to encourage you, not only to keep following Jesus, but to do that evangelism. Mm -hmm. The next verse, verse 11. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Now, there might be many different theological interpretations to this, 
But this is what Jill's gonna give you right now. This is my thoughts, okay? This is my own interpretation. Mm -hmm. When they talk about two keeping the fire burning, I think about the evangelistic fire. I think mm -hmm. about the first love experience that we are called to have with the Lord Jesus. Remember in Revelation, the church had what lost their first mm -hmm. love and they were supposed to recapture that. And so I believe that when you have small groups or more than one person involved, that that keeps the fire, as it were, burning in your heart mm -hmm. for Jesus, mm -hmm. for his word and for evangelism. Let's read the last verse, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, of course, we can indicate that means Jesus is at the center of any relationship or any friendship, but there's also strength, you could say, in numbers. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but it really helps me, Pastor Kenny, if I have an exercise partner. Right? Absolutely. If I'm going to go out and go running or go exercising, it helps if someone else is there to exercise with me or to have a prayer partner or an accountability partner. But it also helps to have evangelism partners. And this week we talk about small group evangelism. Let's read our memory text, Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Mm -hmm. On Sunday's lesson, we look at small groups, God's idea first. And the analogy used on Sunday's lesson is that the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was the very first small group yeah. that we're going to find in scripture. Now, I want to be very careful here because when you're using any analogy in regard to the mysterious aspects of God, you need to be careful. So we're not trying to make light in any sense of that. Just discussing as the lesson discussed on Sunday that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, are united in purpose, in mission, in goal. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at some various aspects we see throughout scripture where we see the entire Godhead involved together. We're going to start with creation. We see that God had involved in creation. So let's look at that. We'll start with God the Father. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You can turn there if you want, or you can just quote it at home with me. Right. The Word of God says, in the beginning, God created yeah. the heavens and the earth. This is God in contrast to atheism. God created alone in contrast to polytheism. He rules over creation in contrast to pantheism. Matter had a beginning as opposed to materialism. Now, when it says God created the heavens and the earth, we discussed this a couple lessons ago, that word created, bara, mm -hmm. meaning God created something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Only God can create something out of nothing. In Genesis 1, 3, we see God speaking. He says what? Let there be light, mm -hmm. and there was light. God spoke and it was done. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mm -hmm. mouth. God spoke and worlds came into yeah. existence. Amen. God the Father was definitely present and involved in creation. But we also see God the Son, Jesus Christ, being present and involved in creation. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, we referenced this a couple lessons ago. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, mm -hmm. through whom also he made the worlds. Mm -hmm. God created the worlds, what? Through Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. We see that in Ephesians 3, 9. The New Testament especially talks about Jesus being involved in creation. Old Testament references God a lot in creation. New Testament, we see Jesus as well being involved in that creative act. Ephesians 3, verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, mm. which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. 
the world, all things were created through Jesus Christ. We see the same principle in Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Paul says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him. Now that word create, I know we're New Testament and this is Greek, but it has the same meaning as bara in the Old Testament. The word's actually from a Latin word. To, it means to make something out of nothing. Now, where have we heard that yeah, before? Right. To make something out of nothing. So whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, talking about God the Father or God the Son, Jesus Christ, either one, both of them together right. created mm -hmm. something out of nothing. Amen. The God, the Holy Spirit, was also involved in creation. Yeah. Genesis 1 verse 2, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered mm -hmm. over the face of the waters. That word ruach, breath, wind, spirit, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. I think it's Psalm 104 verse 30. Mm -hmm. The Word of God says, you send forth your spirit they are created and you renew the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit being intimately involved in creation. But not only were God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit involved in creation, they were all, we see them all again at Jesus' baptism. Mm -hmm. That is in Matthew 3, let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son mm -hmm. in whom I am well pleased. All three persons of the Godhead present at Jesus' baptism. Of course, Jesus was. He's the one being baptized, Pastor Kenny. Yes. Then we hear God the Father because his voice sounds from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Wouldn't you love that? Well, to hear mm. that spoken of you. This yes. is my beloved child. Mm -hmm. I think about God speaking to Satan about Job. Have you considered yeah. my wow. servant Job? What a beautiful thing. Then, of course, at the baptism of Jesus, we see the Holy Spirit descending. We see yeah. all three present. We see in the Great Commission, all three are involved there. That's Matthew 28. You can probably quote it if you've watched 3 ABN because we refer to that quite a bit. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them just in God. No, in the name of the oh, Father mm -hmm, right. and of the Son mm -hmm. and of the Holy right. Spirit. Amen. All three intimately involved, not only in creation, but in the work of redemption. That's right. And if we think about this concept of small groups, and as we discuss throughout this week, this lesson, we'll be talking about the purpose of small groups really being evangelism. Mm -hmm. Clearly we can do in reach and we can encourage and edify each other. That is a beautiful thing. We can encourage each other to study the word of God and pray together. That is a beautiful thing. But the purpose is evangelism, That's right. to right. reach out to mm. a lost and dying world. Right. Second Timothy 2, we know the heartbeat of God is that all would come to repentance, all would be That's saved. Right. Second mm. Timothy 2, 3 and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires just a couple people. No, mm. he desires all men oh. to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then, of course, 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah. Uh -huh. So God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are one in purpose, one in mission. And what is the mission? From the foundation of the world, set in place. God would send his son, Jesus, as the propitiation for our sins, yeah. the sacrifice yeah. 
the blood of Jesus so that we could spend eternity with him. And it's the Holy Spirit, the power of the indwelling spirit in your life and in mine that empowers us, that changes us, that transforms us into the image of Jesus and sends us forth as mm. his witness. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kenny. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, you know, all that stuff is just trying to soak it up like a sponge. We need to. This is, this is all good information. The lessons are, are really good, too. We, we know that God's, that God's blessing your heart, too. Uh, Monday's lesson, small groups in Scripture. Um, you know, I, I think probably as we, as we go back years ago, and I can be corrected on my thoughts, when you said small group, Sometime it was a little bit, of, it seemed to be offensive or it hurt certain folks that maybe didn't understand about small groups in, in Scripture. When it said it's kind of small group, well, this is kind of an offshoot. This is another group over here. But, you know, I'm thankful to find it in Scripture right. that we can, we can bank and say this is a good foundation which we can use. So the Bible gives us an example of small groups coming together, notice, to study, to praise, and, you know, and certainly to pray together. Small groups provide opportunities that large groups you know, they can't afford it. Some people don't want to go to a small church or a small group because they feel like they're lost sometime yeah. in, in a bigger group. Not everybody feels that way, but some do. So each one in a small group is able to use their gift that God has given them maybe in a way they couldn't do in a larger place. Mm -hmm. So small groups then provide simply a fellowship, spiritual growth, and problem solving. I like that in the lesson, problem solving, and that does, that, that's not problem making, right. problem solving. <laughs> We are told, and this is by group specialist. I didn't even know they had group specialist. But they have group specialist <laughs> right. that studies groups and so on and how many should sure. be in it. And I wonder where they got their information. Kind of interesting. Group specialist just simply said that the perfect group or small group would be between 6 and 12 people. Hmm. Well, kind of interesting. That's because that's where everybody can participate and no one gets left out and so on and so forth. That's the numbers in between those is the ones that Jesus used. Isn't that right? And Moses yeah used in forming their groups mm -hmm. when Jesus simply went, made the call, you know, come on, come follow right. me, which is good. So I want to just give a couple passages of scripture if it's, if it's all right, because it supports uh, the small groups and we call them uh, having church in, in a house or in a home. Mm -hmm. And so first one is Romans 16, verse 5, Romans 16, verse 5. Now, I'm not trying to make any point other than what the Word of God says here. You know, I, I believe there's some people who cannot get out. There's some people who, you know, th there's no church anywhere near them or whatever. And so they're going to have to meet. And uh, I think the Bible is very clear where, where, his, where Christ's presence is. That's where his church is. So it's, it's okay. Romans 16 verse 5 says, uh, Greet the, ch the church that is in their house. So just using a few words there. Greet what? The church, church. that is in where? That's in yeah. their house. Good. Early Christians had no church, did they? Right. Didn't have them. So they met in a house. They, they relied upon uh, uh, members that, with hospitality right. that they would open their doors and say, we have a small group here. We don't have a building anywhere. So just come, come to my house. We'll, right. we'll have church. We'll sing some songs. We'll read some scripture and praise God. Now, notice this. Acts chapter 12, 12 is interesting. Uh, it, it, it simply, it says this. There was a prayer meeting held at Mary's house. This was the mother of John. Mm -hmm. So there was a prayer meeting. There was a group that came together at, you know, the mother of, of, uh, of, mother, mother right. of John. Yeah, was it John? Okay, For, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19 says, and it talks about Aquila and Priscilla. They had a church in their house. Hmm. Why? Because church buildings were not common until about what, in the second century. Mm -hmm. And so as they came, then people began to go and begin to expand. But this worked out rather nicely because the a chance to grow. Jesus used small groups. Why? Because he could keep them close to him. That's right. He could teach them and show them and certainly put them out there so they could evangelize. Another passage of scripture in Colossians 4 verse 5 simply says this. It talks about salute the brethren and the church which is in the house. Mm -hmm. So to me, there's biblical foundation that we can say, okay, then right in the beginning, God said, there, you know, you'd have the house and, you know, mm -hmm. church in, in a house. It's, it's okay to do that. And I, I really believe, and I'm very encouraged by what I hear in leadership today, encouraging home churches or, you know, where you can't get out anywhere else is to come together, study the word of God, and then branch out and to go. So I'm encouraged by that. Amen. I'm going to turn my Bible to the book of uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 18. I want to read this. I think it's very, very important. Several verses, verses uh, what, 24 through about um, 25. 
No, 21, yeah, through 25. Exodus chapter 18. I always like to say, notice what the Bible says. That's notice right. what the Bible says here. It says, Moreover, thou shalt provide, provide out of all the people able men, such as what? Fear God of the truth. This is Exodus 18, remember, starting with verse 21. Notice this, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of what, fifties, and rulers of tens. Notice to verse 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter that they shall bring unto thee, but every matter, small matter, they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden of thee. Now, who's really speaking? What's going on here? You remember the background? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't this Moses' father-in-law, Jethro? That's right. He mm -hmm. was coming with help. You, you think about if you, if you went to Moses, you know, the man of God, Moses the man, right? And then you would, the father-in-law even come and say, look, I've got some advice. You know, what a meek man he was. What a man of God because he was willing to listen. The burdens were heavy and he needed some help. Verse 23 says, If thou shalt do this thing and God command thee so, then shalt thou be able to endure and all the people shall, notice it, also go, to their place in peace. Mm -hmm. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose what able men out of Israel, made them heads over the people, rulers, thousands, rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, and rulers over ten. Mm -hmm. So here's where it really developed. We read here, heavy responsibility here was resting on the leaders of God's church. Right. God's movement. I mean, it gets to be heavy. There's some people who like that responsibility. There's some people who, uh, in fact, nothing can be done unless it's approved by them and run by them. But here, real wisdom is simply that we get counsel. We get help because the work is great. And we need help so that we can go about doing what God has you know, impressed us to do, not get caught up in some of the things that need to be done, but not what maybe we're supposed to be doing. Moses tried to shoulder all of this responsibility, too heavy. It would crush him if he continued on the way. His family saw it. I'm sure the other leaders saw it. And so naturally they wanted to step out and, and, and to help. And so Jethro came in with a plan to distribute the work. He even told Moses to appoint rulers over what? Thousands and over hundreds and fifties and tens. Notice this, all, I'll let the word circle, mm -hmm. all in the camp of Israel became at the beginning a, a, a part of a group of 10. Mm. Kind of interesting. All were involved. Again, we saw small groups. Leaders must be qualified. I like that part. Mm -hmm. You know, what is a leadership? He said it, there's qualifications here. Men should be as fear God, yeah. men who have been, I want to call it born again, men right. who are, you just don't grab somebody and stick them into office because you don't have anybody else. That's right. Somebody said, right. I'll take the job if... I'll take the job if no one else will do it. And I said to them at a board meeting, then you don't get it. Maybe that's a little out of line. Well, they were going to take it, Pastor, because right. no one else would do it. You know they're not going to do a good job if they do that. You have, to, yeah, you have to want to do it for the cause of Christ, not because no one else will take it. That's right. So <laughs> he chose men that feared God, men who were born again, men who were converted. Notice, men of truth. <laughs> Notice that uh, hating covetousness and so on, they would judge the people in all seasons and small things and the big things would go back to Moses. That's right. But notice that reminds me so much of um, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3 where you get the qualifications of, of deacons and deaconess were and elders, right? Bishops mm -hmm. of the church. There are qualifications and you know we're to never hurry anyone mm -hmm. into that office. They have to be proven. They should be proven men and you know in, 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 the, in the cause of Christ. And well, I know one of the qualifications, I'll probably get in trouble if I say that, but one of the qualifications simply says they, they, they need to rule their own house well. Well, that's mm -hmm. going to disqualify quite a few as far as I'm concerned. That's just me. <laughs> Let me go with that. Later when we're choosing, <laughs> choosing the 70 elders, it's okay to have a personal opinion, Thanks. right? That's, right? That's Based good. upon experience and things that you've seen and so on and so forth. That says it in the Word of God, then what are we going to do? We're going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. That's what it says, all of the right. things. Okay. Moses laid a solemn charge on these men, choosing the 70, you know, the elders. And it's still good for the church today. And I wish we had more time we'd read that. But just jot it down. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. This is good counsel. Mm. We're not too big to receive counsel. It's good. We come together we, as a grace of God and we counsel, we pray together and, uh, you know, and God is sure to give us the right answers. But never get too high horse that we can't listen 
to other people or not listen to God. God all He wants to do is to help us in this work. Mm -hmm. He wants to alleviate a lot of the burdens that many people carry that need not carry them. And let's go about the business of winning souls in the kingdom mm -hmm. of God. That's why we are here. Praise God. We have the word and we go right. to the word and right, we learn from the word and by God's grace we follow the Amen. word. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Kenny. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with more study of small groups. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study, Dealing with Small Groups, as we see evident throughout Scripture. We'll pick it up with Tuesday, Pastor Ryan, organized for service. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> Lots of information and little time to cover it in, but that's okay. You know, I have to say, though, Brother Kenny, that as you were studying that uh, and bringing that lesson out beautifully about the small groups and churches, you know, churches being essentially in homes in the first century, it's powerful to think the fact that Jesus Christ mm. And his disciples were driven out of his own house, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And they had to literally go relocate. And they basically ended up having church on a mountain under an olive tree, yeah. um, which is powerful. I mean, where, where, I guess you could say where, you know, if you're looking for the church, it's where the people are, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where they are. Where they, Hey, that's wow. kind of similar to what your uncle said. That some powerful words. Yes, where, wherever I go, there I am. Yeah. Well, wherever. <laughs> powerful. Wherever I go, there I am. Wherever, wherever the church is, there they are. Come on, that's now. where the, the people of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I don't know why I felt the need to say that, but that just worked out perfectly there. Uh, talking about organized service, we organize in small groups for service, and the body of Christ must function properly. And uh, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter twelve, specifically verses twelve through. 26. Okay. So uh, this is a passage we've already referenced. Jill had, I remember doing a previous lesson where you had brought this particular passage out very well. We're simply going to do a little bit of review, but we're going to highlight a few things as well in reference to organization for the purpose of serving mm -hmm. uh, within the church. And so again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses uh, 12 through 26. And so notice what the Bible begins to say in verse 12. It says, it says for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, mm. whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. I like that, the yes. unity, the mm -hmm. one aspect. Yeah. And then verse 14, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And I think that's kind of a, a thesis statement that would really sum this up is that while we are uh, many people, we are still one body. And I love the yes. fact that, you know, the unity aspect is emphasized here uh, because isn't that what Christ prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane before yes. being arrested and taken to the cross? He would pray, Lord, uh, you know, let them be one as you and me, Father, yes. are one. And so Christ is bringing, or through the Spirit, Christ is bringing this out to Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, emphasizing the oneness of the body, but yet functioning, you know, with many members. Yes. But right. notice what it continues on in verse 15 and onward. It says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore... Okay. not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? <laughs> if the whole body were an eye, and we visualized that a little bit in a previous wow. lesson, can't imagine the whole body being an eye be rather something interesting to look at. Uh, whether, what it says right here, if the whole body were an eye, well. where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? And then notice verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. And I want to emphasize that. 
we are functioning together, yes, in one body, many, many people in one body. But notice who does the setting, who does the distributing uh, of, of the different services uh, in these small groups as he wills. It's God. Mm -hmm. yeah. He it says here, in the body just as he pleases. So it's, a, it's, it's fascinating to me as we brought this out earlier in a study that there's people that will you know, say, well, you know, I don't really want to serve here. I want to serve over there. Or, I envy those who get to serve in this or get this particular position or that position. Or uh, you know, we, we, we squander and, and we quarrel over you know, these little bitty issues. But yet, in a sense, what we're essentially saying is, God, you misplaced me. You put me somewhere that I don't want to be, right? Yeah. And so you're challenging God, but he, he has put you there just as he pleased. In verse 19, it says, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now let's go to verse, verse 20 and onward. Mm -hmm. But now indeed there are many members, again, yet one body. He establishes that clearly throughout this passage. Mm -hmm. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Mm -hmm. no. no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then verse 23, notice this. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, uh -oh. on these we bestow greater honor. Wow. Like that's powerful. Yeah. But to think that someone might think in that way, like, oh, you know, I'm in a higher position or I'm in a greater position and they're in a less important position or, or you know, they're, they're not as honorable as where I am. But yet some, of, some people may have that stinking thinking in their head. But notice God yeah. brings it. He brings it up here. He says, look, they, we bestow upon those people greater honor. Mm -hmm. And our wow. unpresentable parts, as Pastor brought out in a previous lesson, the unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Those people who are under the stage or behind the stage mm. may not be in the public eye. They're doing a great work for the Lord as well. Yeah, that's right. Right. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, right. but that the members should have the same care for one right. another. Yeah. And then I love how this passage yeah. ends, or this particular segment ends. It says, and if one member suffers, all members suffer within yeah. it. And if one member is honored, all members rejoice in it. Yeah. I love that beautiful system of organization that is established here. Uh, and, and what's interesting to me is when you study this particular passage, you will see that God likens the service or the organization of the small groups into systems. He likens it kind of, he uses body analogies. He uses anatomy analogies. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, our human body is made up of multiple different systems. Mm -hmm. And it's not limited to the ones that I'm about to mention, but I'm thinking of, you know, the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the nervous system, the skeletal system. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we removed the skeletal system from the body? Oh. If you took out all the tendons and the joints and the bones and you removed it, what would you have left? That would be crazy to think about, right? The body wouldn't be able to stand. It would, it would just be a, a limber pile of flub, right? Or, or I don't know if that's the correct word to say, but essentially that's exactly what God is saying here. He says you remove one of these systems mm -hmm. that if it doesn't function properly in and of itself as a, as a combined organized system, then the rest of the body suffers for it. Could you imagine that if somebody's obviously cardiovascular system fails them, the rest of the body follows? Follows. Spiritual right. gifts. Now here's the point. Spiritual gifts are like the different parts of the body. They function best when organized into systems or groups. Good. So if everyone is functioning within their smaller group system that is organized for the purpose of functionality and advancement, then the entire body functions well. Yeah. At the same time, they cannot function at all long term on their own. They must work together, organized within their system of functionality for the whole body to function properly. Like the body, the church functions best from a small group standpoint. I love this quote here that, that, that uh, is brought out in the lesson from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, page 21 and 22. I love this. And she says in the opening sentence, the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. Oh. Mm -hmm. So she's saying right up front, what I'm about to tell you about the functioning of God's church in smaller group systems. She says, uh, this was not just something I cooped up. This was given to me by the one who cannot err. Obviously, this comes from God. Mm -hmm. She goes on to say, if there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into small companies right. to work not not only for the church members, but for unbelievers. Right. That's powerful. Yes. We are to not just function uh -huh. for just each other within the, within the church as perhaps a club would, because the church isn't a club. 
That's you know, right. we're here. We're here to serve each other and all of those outside of the body yeah. as well. She goes. Uh, she said, goes on to say, uh, but also for unbelievers, if in one place there are only two or three who know the truth, let them form themselves into a band of workers. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Let them keep their bond of union unbroken, pressing together in love and unity, encouraging one another to advance, mm -hmm. each gaining courage and strength from the assistance of the others. Mm -hmm. So basically in conclusion, in the little time I have left, small group ministry is ordained by God to enable each church member to grow spiritually, mm -hmm. experience warm fellowship, yeah. and utilize their God-given gifts in service. Now, unfortunately, this plan doesn't mm -hmm. always right function well within the church uh, for many different reasons, whether it be power-hungry dictators who want to do things their way. But really, ultimately, it comes down that I find is usually the, the system doesn't function properly because you know, the lack of revival, the lack mm -hmm. of personal, dedicated, daily devotion to Christ. If we are connected and in yeah. tune with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is truly leading and guiding us, then this small group system for the purpose of service will function properly yes, will. and God's church will grow and it yes. will advance Amen. according to His plan. Praise Amen. God. Nice Amen. God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I, I sense that each one of you could keep on going uh, <laughs> if uh, time would allow. But uh, my part is to Wednesday, New Testament small groups in the lesson. And as we look at the book of Acts, we notice that the church exploded in growth. Mm. In a few, a few short years, it grew from small groups of believers to tens of thousands of worshipers, as the lesson brings out. And one of the contributing factors for the rapid, rapid growth of, of the New Testament church was their small group organization. Mm. Now, I want to uh, uh, underline and highlight, underline and highlight that uh, we're talking about small groups as a uh, New Testament example uh, mm -hmm. that we see here. This by no means says that we are not to unite in church, right. churches mm -hmm. yeah. together. Uh, this this gr small group ministries is done during the week mm -hmm. and you come together on the Sabbath day to worship together. All the small groups come together and this uh, will be of encouragement to believers. Uh, what a blessing when we think of the general conference session mm -hmm. when uh, uh, groups of believers come mm -hmm. from all over the world, unite together. And, you know, we've seen places where we have 50,000 believers, 70,000, uh, yeah. I think at one time we had, and close to 80,000. Mm -hmm. What a blessing to mm -hmm. see people from different cultures together worshiping God mm -hmm. and singing, we have this hope that mm -hmm. burns wow. within Amen. our heart. Amen. What a blessing. And, of course, this is, uh, you can sing the same song in a little group, and it's a blessing. But when you see the great company of believers, it's a tremendous blessing that we should have the opportunity to, to example. If you have never gone to a general conference session, the next one, make it a point to go. So let's continue here as we go to Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Uh, you will notice some things here that uh, Paul brings out. And uh, there are many lessons we can gather from these verses. We're going to go to Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And these are the words we find. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, and some people say Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. There they were together and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. So what we see here is that in the book of Acts, several individuals are named and the things they do. Let's go over to the book of Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. And here in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, uh, we have, uh, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them. What? Embraced them? Yes, embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. That will, that's a, a part of what believers did. They even met each other with a holy kiss. 
Uh, now, when he had gone over that region and encountered, uh, encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. <laughs> so you see people from different cultures cultures meeting together and uh, worshiping God, studying together. Mm. It is a blessing. This is, uh, as, as you heard, uh, this is a, something of God's divine order mm -hmm. uh, from one that cannot err. Uh, err. This is a, a blessing to people. What happens when you are in small groups? As you have heard, people get to know one another better, you know, uh, and they have more opportunity to participate together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard that uh, 6 to 12 is a good number for small groups. If it grows beyond 12, then uh, you should form another group. And so this yeah. is uh, uh, a, a, after God's order that these groups fortify one another, strengthen one another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a large group setting, imagine a church of a thousand people. And you say, well, let's go ahead and ask uh, who wants to uh, give a testimony for the Lord. Well, you have a thousand people. How long are you going to be there well, if everyone really has an opportunity? Right. Because we, uh, there are scriptures that say that God daily loads us with benefits. So each person should have something to testify and glorify God for. So the small groups provide people with an opportunity right. for their talents to develop, opportunity to share, to read the scriptures together. And one key element is prayer, right. prayer, mm -hmm. much prayer. Yeah. And sometimes uh, we meet together in, in groups and there's just too much talking, too much talking. <laughs> we need to spend more time right. in prayer right. and the study of God's word. And I would like to, uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, see how I can divide the time here to share something uh, miraculous with you. And so let's go ahead and... Uh, uh, I'm going to read to you from uh, manuscript release 12, 241, page 241. My mind has been dwelling upon the subject of prayer. Little groups should gather and seek the Lord earnestly. We are as a people sadly neglecting this means of grace. Christ declares, and the words were spoken after his resurrection. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And because of this power, he adds the great gospel commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mm. And so, small groups is something that we find in the New Testament as uh, something that worked uh, well for the church. It works well today. In some places, it seems a little difficult because, for example, you, you think of places like Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard of people uh, that travel over an hour to get home. <laughs> By the time you get home and you eat and, you know, when can you do these small groups? And so we have to find a place because this is a, it's a blessing. Find a time when this, mm -hmm. uh, these small groups can work because it is a blessing for the church. Mm -hmm. Now I want to tell you about uh, Peru. Peru for many years, uh, the union would meet together and say, well, let's see, as a, as a territory uh, of churches, how many do you believe? And so they would set a goal. This year we want to win X, uh, X amount of thousands of people. Right. And so every year they would look, how do we do? And so... The goal was here, and the, so, and the souls or people that have been won was here, uh -huh. and they, they kept having trouble reaching, reaching this goal. Mm. And they had started lowering to come up where, oh. where uh, the people were really uh, coming in to see, okay, we only, if they set a goal for 20,000 and they only reach 18, uh, 18,000, then you, got, you keep adjusting. So somebody said, well, we need to, we need to, let's do a study to see how we can best, best organize ourselves. And they discovered the small group ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the opportunity to go there. We had an evangelistic campaign uh, that was broadcast on 3ABN in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. We had the opportunity to go to Lima, Peru. Pastor Alejandro Bujon was preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, uh, Elder uh, Jan Paulson was president of the General Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, on Friday evening, uh, 
Pastor Yen Paulson had the opportunity to, to baptize two individuals because uh, the Lord did a great and mighty things. Mm, yeah. They noticed that when they organized themselves into small groups, they set the goal and they passed the goal. So now they have to bring the goal up. And they set the goal and they passed the goal. And this is what's about the third year when Yen Paulson was there. And he baptized two individuals. And when he did this, they reached 27,000. 100 people baptized in one year. Wow. Wow. So they said, this is amazing. This yes. works. Yes. <laughs> so we had the opportunity to be in a meeting. Uh, presidents of unions and conferences came yeah. from all, all over South America. And they listened to, what, what did you do to mm -hmm. make this happen? And they presented that we organized ourselves into small groups. Mm -hmm. And they presented the plan they had. They had a time for singing. They had a time for sharing testimonies. Mm -hmm. They had a time for prayer. They would study the Bible together, a systematic study of the topics yeah. of the Bible. And this is what made the difference. Yeah. And then somebody said, hey, hey, I have a question. One of the conference presidents asked, yes, said the union president for Peru. How is it that I, I, we noticed that, or we noticed that there seems to be unity among you. Mm -hmm. How did you achieve this? Good. And so uh, he gave an answer. And to me, it was clear that the answer was, we are meeting together. We are praying together and studying together. And the results is unity in God's church. Wow. Praise Amen. Wow. It's amazing. Wow. Good. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you for great story. giving me all that I need to go and put this <laughs> together. I want to come at this unity uh, idea of small groups from a completely different perspective, pointing out what each group needs and what they need to be cautious of. Okay. Now, it's possible to be in small groups and be together but be dead. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm. Yeah. Ezekiel 37. Mm. Let's go and see a picture <laughs> of Israel the way that God didn't want them to become. Mm. They went small groups. They, there was no division. Mm. Everybody finally agreed together. Mm -hmm. There were no arguments. No one was trying to leave the church. No one had a thought that conflicted with the other person's thought. But they were all dead. Mm -hmm. They were a valley of dry bones. Bone. Well. That's right. So there's unity, then there's unity the way God wants it to be. That's good. Yes. So I'd like to point this out. A couple of very important points. You may have heard the story, but just very quickly walk with me. Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord, verse 1, came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley. And I, it was full of bones, and he mm -hmm. caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And he answered like a, he answered like a good pastor. That's right. <laughs> oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and he said to me, prophesy to these bones, preach to them, say to them, oh, dry bones, what's the first step in bringing people back to life? Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word yeah. of the Lord. That's the first step. Thus, verse 5, say to Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. What's the second step? God has to breathe on them. Yes. That's right. yes. The word has to be first imparted. This is in all groups. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord has to breathe upon them. He breathed upon Adam, the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Without groups, without the word and without the breath of God in the midst are just a valley of dry bones. Yes. Mm. So don't just have groups for the sake of groups because this yeah. group was together. Nobody conflicted. The rich and the poor were together. Nobody, there was no disharmony. Yeah. They all finally agreed. No Republicans, no Democrats. Mm -hmm. They were all <laughs> in the same location. Nobody argued, but they were all dead. Yeah. Mm. So it may look perfectly unified, but when the Lord's word is not imparted, and the caution is some groups get together and they omit the necessity of God's word. Mm. They get together to, to have the pastor for lunch. Mm. Uh, uh oh. That's when you're talking about they're doing too much talking, you see. Right, they get together to <laughs> gossip, to talk about all the problems in the church, oh, wow. to talk about what they don't like, mm. to talk about how things could be done differently, and all they do is represent a valley of dry bones. That's right. Because the word of God is not being imparted. And the Lord will not breathe on his people unless the word of God is imparted first. Mm -hmm. The next thing he has to do is he has to change the way we look in his presence. He has to give us his righteousness. Verse yeah. 6, mm -hmm. 
I will put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall what? Live. 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 Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Some people don't have a relationship with God, don't know who he is because he has not covered them with his righteousness. Mm. Right. The word, the spirit, and then he has to cover us with his righteousness. So I prophesied, verse 7, as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was noise and suddenly a rattling and uh -oh. the bones came together yeah. bone to bone. Mm -hmm. You know what? <laughs> if a group is too quiet, it's dead. That's right. That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, I'm all right. Yeah. Don't say that too loud. Gotta have some noise in the group. <laughs> I cannot stand. You know, Ellen White uses this phrase in the book Evangelism. She says, sometimes the message is going forth. Let me not talk like a New Yorker. Sometimes the message is going forth, and she says, people won't even open their mouth and bark. Yeah. Mm. She called them dead dogs. Yeah. Oof. She said, the word of God is being imparted, and they won't even agree with it. They won't even bark. The word bark means amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, not that it's a cultural omission or mm. uh, commission or a necessity or not a necessity. But man, you know, if you want to see a preacher, if you want to see a preacher preach, <laughs> somebody once said, a dog will not bite till you say sick him. Mm -hmm. And a preacher will really preach if you say amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> amen. <laughs> there was a rattling. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. Indeed, I looked. The sinew and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, wow. but there was no breath in them. Uh -oh. mm. They needed something else. Yeah. The Lord gave them physical life, mm -hmm. but some groups that have physical life don't have spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to say very clearly what needed to be done. Verse 9, and he also said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on, the, on these slain, and they will live. And as you know, Verse 10, so I prophesied and breath came into them and they mm -hmm. lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly mm -hmm. great army. The steps mm -hmm. of a, a small group That's right. living is God has to call them through his word. That's right. Then the spirit of God has to bring them back to life. Right. Mm -hmm. Then they have to be covered by his righteousness. Amen. Then he has to fill them with the spirit until those four steps happen in every small group. They are nothing but a valley of dry bones unified for no purpose whatsoever. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. So did I say that? Yes. You said it. The things we must avoid in small groups. Let's first start. The positive things of small groups. Positive things. When Pastor Finley cited Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 32, I'm just going to go ahead and summarize what those brought out. The positive aspects of a group that has the word of God, that has been given physical life, that means they get together for a viable purpose mm. that also has uh, the righteousness of Christ operating among them and that has the spirit of God functioning in and through them. Notice what happens in that group. They intercede for others. It's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They pray about mutual concerns. Mm -hmm. mm. These were all brought out in Acts chapter 20 verses uh, 17 to 32. Mm -hmm. They share warm fellowship. Mm. The difference between Fellowship and friendship is the spirit of God. Mm. Don't go to church looking for friends. Right. You might find a friend, but his friendship is conditional until it's koinonia. Mm. Koinonia brings a unity. Koinonia is the sinew that holds us together. That's right. But friendship changes only as you agree with the other individual. The other thing is study the word of God. They were equipped for service, a small group that just meets for the purpose of being a small group mm -hmm. and does not have a mission for service is a group that has no function whatsoever. That's right. yeah. when, you look at the, when you look at the way that churches grow around the world, now we know in America, we have, the pastors of America have been made to be, expect him to do all in many congregations. And if mm -hmm. he's not doing it all, the church has not grown. And I've asked the question, what's your minister's name? And people said, Pastor John Dinsey. Mm. I said, really, what's the pastor's name? Pastor Loma came. Mm. And you know what? The Lord says that we must equip the church yeah. for ministry. Mm -hmm. So if you ask the question, what's the minister's name? Please put your own. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's because right. we are all ministers, workmen created in Christ Jesus for good work. In this small group also not only equipping for service, but they help protect each other yeah. against false teachers. Mm. When you get together, make sure that what you discuss doctrinally is accepted by the church at large. Mm. 
Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people take these outside opinions by people on the internet and on YouTube and on Facebook and they build a doctrine on the ideologies of a person who doesn't even have a flock. Mm -hmm. And I've discovered that independent ministries that don't have sheep to tend to can cut up anybody else's sheep and walk That's away. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's why you have these people that speak the way they do because they don't have a flock to answer to. That's right. They're only putting this stuff on YouTube to get you upset with the organized body. Can you imagine? They say they don't support organized religion. Who do you know supports disorganized religion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only other option. Some people said, I don't like organized religion. Right. Well, the Lord never intended the church to be disorganized religion. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So the positive impact is, and they participate together in outreach activities. Now, avoid these negative things. Internal plotting against other groups mm. or against the church or against the conference or against the leaders or against other members you don't like. Also, don't use the opportunity of small groups to divide the church and draw away disciples after yourself. Mm. Because Paul and Peter warned about that, that some people only have these small groups <laughs> so that they could draw people out of your church, your church, your church, your church, right. and create their own movement. And we are living in the day and age where the devil has unplugged many people from the power source. Mm. So here's the benefit. Make a difference for Christ. Remain united by using your gifts. Focus on the power of the Spirit for outreach. And don't forget, without the righteousness of Christ, mm -hmm. the small group has no power whatsoever. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Amen. Pastor John. Yeah. I took notes there. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. I want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day or about this week in general, Pastor okay. Katie. I, I think, you know, what I've heard is, is, is good. It's ringing bells for me. And I, there'd be, be some questions. Somebody might just simply say, you know, this small group. Again, maybe they can't go anywhere else. Maybe they're inside the house or maybe people's coming to their house. You know, can they be part of God's church? Absolutely. Acts the Apostle 11 says, From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. Upward look, 315. The church is those that love God and keep His commandments. Mm. Mm. Amen. I agree with that for sure. Yeah, I would say, I would just be reminded that the Scripture tells us that Christ is the head of the body, mm. which is the church. And if we just remove self out of the way and allow Christ to lead the church, uh, you know, the body would function a whole lot better. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, well, I like to say that uh, church meeting together is good. Small groups meeting together is good. God organized the first small groups, that is families. So I want to urge mm -hmm. our people to good. consider family worship. Very important, whether you have a family with children, whether husband and wife. This is your small group to begin with because your family is your first missionary field. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And small groups exist for three reasons. To lead people to Jesus, mm -hmm. to nurture their faith in Jesus, and to equip them to witness for Jesus. Mm. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John, Pastor Johnny, Ryan, and Pastor Kenny. Thank you for sharing from your heart and your own journey with Jesus and your study of the Word of God. And we're always delighted when you can join us as well. I'm reminded of Psalm 133. David the psalmist says, Behold and how, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, mm -hmm. we could say, and sisters, to dwell together in unity. So God calls calls us not to be a dead church, as Pastor John reminded us, but we are to be living by the Word of God, breathed on by the Holy Spirit, and empowered to share Him with a lost and dying world. Join us again next week for lesson number 11, Sharing the Story of Jesus.